Hey everybody, welcome. This is the third Lady Bam podcast. Uh, this is our very first live podcast. We're recording at AlienCon in Pasadena. And we're going to be talking to some extraordinary, extraordinary women, Linda Moulton Howe and Caroline Corey. Um, one of the things that got me interested in the possibility of this is that these women have been listening and writing about and exploring and holding counsel regarding consciousness and other life, other life forms on this planet for a very, very long time. They have gigantic fan bases of people who rely on them to point the way. And I just felt very strongly about the possibility of talking with them about it. What is it like to be them, to be these two women with information that many of us would consider extraordinary to them? It is just simply the truth. So without further ado, let me introduce them. Caroline Corey is a futurist filmmaker, international speaker, and visionary author of best-selling books on consciousness and quantum healing. As a child and throughout her life, Caroline has always been deeply connected to spiritual topics, the study of consciousness, mechanics of the universe, and the discovery of the divine. Caroline works as creative director and producer of many large-scale international sporting and musical events for worldwide audiences. In 2003, Caroline shifted her focus back to her all-time passion and true calling, merging media entertainment and the arts with spirituality, quantum healing, and higher consciousness. She then founded Omnium Media which is a new style of experiential immersive entertainment for planetarium audiences that heighten the sensory perception of the viewer and allow for profound, expansive experiences. Caroline wrote, directed, and produced the animated short feature I Am the Universe, and she has also written feature and TV pilot screenplays. Most recently, Caroline wrote, directed, and produced the feature-length documentary called Gods Among Us. In addition to writing and producing, Caroline has appeared as a guest expert in numerous television shows on supernatural phenomena, including seasons 9 and 10, of the popular History Channel's series, Ancient Aliens. Linda Moulton Howe was born in Boise, Idaho. She received her BA in English Literature and graduated cum laude from the University of Colorado. She was awarded the Stanley Bober Scholarship for her master's degree at Stanford University where she received her MA in communication for her master's thesis. She produced a documentary film for Stanford Medical Center entitled A Picture Calculus at the Stanford Linear Accelerator. Her early work focused on environmental issues. Documentaries included Poison in the Wind and a Sunkissed Poison, which compared smog pollution in Los Angeles and Denver, Fire in the Water about hydrogen as alternative energy source to fossil fuels, and a radioactive water about uranium contamination of public drinking water in a Denver suburb. Howe was on staff at WCVB-TV when the station won an Institutional Peabody Award for Excellence in 1975. Although she has been called the most preeminent ufologist in the world, Linda regards herself as a television producer and an investigative reporter. She explores unexplained phenomena such as cattle mutilations, crop circles, UFO sightings, and alien abductions. Linda has produced numerous UFO-related programming, including a two-hour special, Earth Mysteries, Alien Life Forms, in association with WATL Fox Atlanta, and was supervising producer and original concept creator for UFO Report Sightings, first broadcast in October 1991, which became the sighting series on Fox. She is a regular guest on Coast to Coast and has appeared on CNN, the BBC, Larry King Live, the Discovery Channel, and NBC. 
So, my dear audience, we have two amazing women to talk to. So without further ado, welcome today, Linda Moulton Howe and Caroline Corey. Now, we've just met the three of us. So I feel very, very, very fortunate uh, that not only were you willing to come and sit with us here at 10 a.m. on Saturday after your first night, we all know what that is. Uh, but that these two ladies agreed to talk to me. So here we go. So ladies, I just talked a little bit about both of you, obviously. But the things that I mentioned were the things that one, one can see that you have done in the world. The things that one can't see that you do all the time are, are, are what I'm interested in in that as human beings right now on the planet, we are certainly in this country. Let me just start with that. I feel like we are those of us who perhaps are not seeing the world from a broader view. We are, many of us, suffering with fear of what is happening in nominal reality, fear of what is happening to our planet, fear of the environment, fear of what our government is doing, all kinds of things, or not doing. So my question, uh, and I'll start with you, Linda, okay. is as you watch things happen in, in our country right now, whether it's hashtag me too, or it's uh, the Trump, new Trump policy to separate children and families at the border for misdemeanors, how do you look at that through the lens of your knowledge of, of the planetary realities that are larger than, say, the border of the US and Mexico? It's a big question, but just start with who you are as a woman in this world and who you are as a woman in the larger sense. The first big crack and why there are so many people here at this alien con, I think, was December 16th, 2017, about five or six months ago. And that is that the New York Times, on the, above the fold on the front page, would have a serious story about jet fighters using infrared cameras and releasing not only with the story, but releasing the videos of the infrared video of UFOs, labeled as UFOs, and with serious articles, first on December 16th in the New York Times and then in the Washington Post two days later. And that that event ties everything in the past mm. to the present and I think a new future. Um, you said in the in introduction. What way? In what way does it tie it? Because I came from, um, and my entire life going back to Stanford University was to have a career in science, medicine, and the environment, working as a television and documentary producer, which I did for years. And it was in being a director of special projects at the CBS station in Denver that one of the subjects that came up, again in newspapers, were about the bloodless, trackless mutilation of animals. Mm -hmm. And when I dug into that and had law enforcement telling me that the perpetrators were creatures from outer space, I can remember this feeling, a physical feeling, when my dad had an electrical fence around the garden where we grew up, and my brother and I would touch it just for the experience. And then when a sheriff is looking at me eye to eye and says, Linda, the perpetrators are creatures from outer space, I had exactly that same electrical feeling in my body. And that was in September of 1979. This is June of 2018. So 40 years ago, I was having that visceral reaction in a subject that I knew nothing about. And then I proceed and get deeper and deeper and find that I have uh, discussions with people in military who are talking about face-to-face -face meetings with non-humans 
and we sit here in this uh, alien con today with that crack in the New York Times and the Washington Post having been one of the most significant news stories about the fact that we're not alone in this universe, mm -hmm. that there have been alien intelligences interacting with this planet for millions of years. Our government knows that. They have proof of that. But there was a policy of denial from World War II on, a policy of strict denial. The public and the media were never to know because those governments that were England, Canada, the United States, New Zealand, and Australia, those five allies from World War II, with the lead from Prime Minister Churchill, and we have documents about this, Churchill said to Eisenhower, we cannot tell anybody. We must go 50 years, five zero years from 1943 to 1993, or religions will collapse. There will be social upheaval. Why 50 years? Do you know? I have no idea. That's what Winston Churchill said to Eisenhower. Well, now we're at 2018, and the governments of this world are not moving forward to tell us the truth. And I personally, it's a personal opinion, I think now the large reason is perpetuation of power and money. Now it is a self-fulfilling system and that the public and the media are deliberately left out because as soon as it is world knowledge, we're not alone in this universe and never have been, and they have proof right. up the kazoo, it's a different world that they can't control as easily as they have to this day. Well, let and me ask you a question. So that's why yes. sitting here, yeah, yeah. Past, present, and future have come together. Are right here, and I feel like the, the audiences are in sync with that big crack in the New York Times and the Washington Post. Something has changed, changed. and people are now going past the government. Yes. We are all getting on this page, like the French Resistance, having celebration. Yeah. Yes, we're not alone, and now what we need is to keep going forward with military people who are retired coming forth more and more and telling the truth. Okay, that was wonderful. Sorry, no. that was long. But no, no apologies. That was amazing. But let me ask you one question, and I'm going to come over here. I'll be real here. short. But this is about you, this question. So back when that was, when you had that first jolt of electricity, uh, as the sheriff was looking you dead in your eyes, saying, you know, this was... Uh, the perpetrators are creatures from outer space. The perps are creatures from outer space. The perps are aliens. And you had that feeling. Okay, but then you had to go... How old were you? 30-something. I was born on January 20th, 1942. And you that was great. September of 1979. <laughs> so what was I, 37 or? I don't know, somebody do the math. But somewhere in, somewhere in your 30s, 30 something like that TV show. I right? don't feel much different today. No, I really I don't. don't pay much I'm attention sure you to don't those look much numbers. Different. <laughs> no, but what I'm saying is, so you're, 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 so you're in your 30s, but you still have to like live a life, go to the grocery store, maybe date. I don't know. But now you have this whole other experience of information, experience of information, not just something you're reading about or a movie that you went to see or what have you. You actually felt the truth in, in what he was saying. Is, was there, is, has there been in your life moments where bridging just being, you know, a gal named Linda who is, you know, on her way to the prom or whatever. Did you ever go to a prom? Yeah, in high school. Yeah. And oh, also, wait a minute. Weren't you a Miss America contestant? Yes. Yes. She was. A, <laughs> did you know that? You know. Yes. OK, so I just wanted to quickly ask you, what do you feel about no more bathing suits? Boy, you have packed a lot into those questions. Yeah, um, I know. And let, give me I'll tell you, uh, just so everybody does know, um, I grew up in Boise, Idaho, and my dad was director of aeronautics for the state. And he didn't make very much money, and I watched my mom 
my dad would count out to my mom's hand five $20 bills at the first day of every month, and that's what we lived on, mm -hmm. five $20 mm -hmm. bills. And she made all of our clothes. Uh, I don't remember wanting for anything. I had a rich and wonderful, wonderful, free young life with my brother, and we could go to lunch climbing hills in Boise without anybody worrying about somebody killing us. And when you reach the point where I knew that I wanted to go to college more than anything, I wanted to go, I w and my dad couldn't afford, and mm. it was my father who said, why don't you enter yeah. the Lions Club, this, this Fantastic. And so all these pageants leading up to Atlantic City, I got the scholarship money that would That's take fantastic. me to school. Yeah. And the answer to your question about the electric of a jolt, I don't think I've ever said this to anybody, but that night I was in that sheriff's office all day. And I had to go out and get into my car that had a glass sunroof. And I had grown up, mom and dad said that the first thing I asked for that they remembered at age three was I wanted a piano and a telescope. <laughs> and so I had spent my <laughs> adult, good. I had spent all my life with other kids who liked telescopes. And the sky had always been my friend. I had no fear whatsoever of the night. But as I walked to my car from that sheriff's yeah. discussion, yeah. and when I opened the door and I sat down in the car, I became, I still remember this so clearly, like it was a second ago. I looked up through my sunroof, through that glass, and what came in was that sheriff saying the perpetrators are creatures from outer space. Yeah. And for the first time in my life at age 37, I'm driving for two and a half hours to my house, never having the thoughts that I had in that car. Were you fearful? Nervous. Nervous. Anxious. And by the time I got home, it was after midnight, I was married. My husband was an executive working for Time, Inc. And he had come home from a late meeting, and he was in the kitchen, and he was all dressed. He had beautiful clothes because of the corporate world. They, he was dressed so beautifully. I remember this. And I came in with that, oh, my God, you're never going to believe this, and told him what had happened. And my husband was six foot four, and I'm five foot two. And he came and he's looking down at me and he said, well, so what? We have to get up in the morning and brush our teeth and Yay. go to work. Good husband. <laughs> right. Okay. Let, let, let me move on for yeah. a second. I want to bring um, Caroline into this. Although I do appreciate, I really do appreciate um, the beginning of this discussion of going from being a person just riding around to a person riding around going, oh, what's out there? Now, Caroline, uh, as a child, my understanding is very early on, you became aware that you literally could see people's thought form. Is that correct? Is that the right way to say it? Yeah. Um, when I was five years old, I had an experience. Um, I was just there, minding my own business. Um, it where was, where was, was that? Where were you living? It was actually in France, because yes, I grew up in yes. France, and it was Christmas Eve. Oh I remember my because my parents and everybody was uh, busy doing the Christmas tree and this whole thing. Right. And I was just looking around thinking, what does this have to do with love? Oh. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking to me Christmas was about love, and I didn't understand how parents were behaving, like how adults were behaving. I was kind of a strange child. <laughs> but anyway, having these thoughts, all of a sudden, I see this energy form. It was like a, it was like a, a, a ball of light. It just kind of showed up. And it started to communicate with me. I could see it, sense it, feel it, hear it. 
it was the most strange thing and at the same time the most comforting beautiful experience and it was very natural it wasn't like oh my god you know like i'm seeing a ghost or anything like that so you were comfortable very comfortable in fact the energy that emanated from that light body was about love oh. and so it was as if it was responding to yeah. <laughs> and so and we started communicating telepathically and this is when I realized okay, now wait a minute yes now hold on yes <laughs> now do you see how easily she said that so then we just started communicating telepathically <laughs> and I'm like okay now wait yeah are we missing a step or did you just know how to communicate telepathically? Exactly. That's that's what I wanted to say is that it just happened. Wow. All of a sudden I could hear their thoughts, what they were saying. And they were saying that uh, we were from a similar lineage. We came from the same place. We're part of the same energy. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And that's what was the most important thing they showed me how telepathic communication happens and this is when i realized that i could perceive subtle energy and what i mean by that is that i could see basically the space between you and me mm. and i could see the your consciousness basically can you see mine now I can. Oh my God. <laughs> Are you sure you want to talk about it? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. I do not. That, I shouldn't have even asked that. Yeah. What, I, I'm, no, no. This is about you. <laughs> we'll do yes. that privately. We'll do it later. Yeah. Privately. Thank you. Yeah. Um, no, but so that was pretty extraordinary because I realized that everything is information. Okay. And the way information happens is through, a, it's kind of like a hologram. It's like, you know, we see the 3D bodies, we, th we see the 3D world, but the 3D world exists within a much bigger multidimensional space. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was seeing. And that, so therefore, it's kind of like the, the medium within which we exist. Okay. And so, so because of that, I could see how their thoughts were actually like little codes that were basically traveling from them to me and and vice versa and i was five years old so oh. <laughs> i was like it made perfect sense it was normal it was natural it was as if that's the way we're supposed to communicate that's kind yeah. of the reaction i had i know it sounds very strange it doesn't sound strange it sounds truthful but I'm wondering, then what did you do? It was Christmas Eve. Did you go back to the group? Did you tell anyone? What What did you do? I actually didn't talk about it to anyone because I, it felt like something very s sacred, or I want to mm -hmm. say private, private, you know? And the most important thing is before they left, they told me that everybody's connected to their original lineage. That was extremely important to me to understand and also that this communication never stops. So everybody who gets downloads, who gets inspiration, who gets guidance, gut feeling, it's all coming from this bigger consciousness. Wow. And so, um, and also they said, this is how it works. So if you want to continue this communication, you can consciously and deliberately focus your mind in this way. And this is how you can communicate. So at the age of five, it made perfect sense. <laughs> it just kind of, I don't know, it's, it's weird to describe, but it really felt it very natural. And so I didn't talk about it. And I think it was a good thing because oh, I think I my parents, yeah. Because what does a parent do with that, really, truly, uh, yeah. without prior knowledge? Exactly. And now I, I work with a lot of children. You do? Yeah, wh who, ha who have invisible friends. Oh, yeah. And so, of yeah. course, I get it because... I've had a few. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Who hear things, who see things. And so that experience helped me understand at a very young age that this is real. Yeah. The kids are not crazy. Yeah. People are not crazy. We just don't know how it works. Well, okay, so 
then as you got older, how did you live in both worlds? Did you like go to high school? Did you date? I don't know why I'm <laughs> on this dating thing, but I'm just trying to figure out like, and for people and my listeners who this is kind of perhaps a little new to, yeah. it's sort of how does one open up to all of this other information while it continuing to operate in a world that doesn't really completely acknowledge, oh, uh, certainly the, the power structures are hell-bent on keeping that secret. So how, how, did right. you, how did you traverse the two worlds as a young woman, a woman in your teens, early 20s? Did yeah. you have any I problems think, with that or no? Actually, in a strange way, I didn't because I just led a double life. It's as if, ah, you know, I, I, felt like, <laughs> I felt like internally I was understanding things and, you know, coming to terms with certain things and uh, growing with the knowledge on my own. And yeah. then my outer reality was like, okay, I'm going to school, studying this. So I had this double life. Yeah. Uh, it was a little strange because the real me was so much bigger oh, exactly. <laughs> you know? That's and my then point. the real yeah. me was like why are we doing this like school so, is, doesn't make so sense silly. yeah yeah so yeah. wow so did you feel it all like a secret agent or were you out <laughs> there as an investigative reporter before you could even no i remember the feeling constantly in 79 through 80 up to 86 okay. of being in two worlds uh being very defensive and knowing that I was dealing with hard facts and trying to report them without scaring people. That is a very difficult path to walk. Yes. And that um, because my husband was in the corporate world mm -hmm. and we did a lot of travel in New York and, and around, um, he basically said, you just can't talk about this. And so when you are living with somebody who is the father of your child and you've been best friends since Stanford and they say you can't talk about your work because it will threaten, that's, the, that's what begins to be a gulf. And you could ask you, the reverse, I, why I wouldn't you? I say, yeah. yes, I get it and I could move on to doing a billion other things. Right. It's sort of, in a strange way, what she's saying, exactly. something in me was feeling as if this is truly now I'm entering the destiny that my life is supposed to go. And I know those sound like poetic words, but no, it was. Not at all. And so what happened, like a crossfade, this is the life we had. In comes mutilations and a sheriff and all this other. And even though I, I loved this world up to this point, something comes in and says, you have to keep trying to find out more. Yes. And that in trying to go forward, getting answers on are we alone? Why would anything be mutilating animals? Why abducting humans? What is, why is the government covering this up? If it were a happy story, they would have told us. These are all the things that started driving me forward, feeling like this is absolutely the most important subject you could ever investigate, and then you're divorced. I mean, that's what happens. And then you're divorced? Well, that's what is inevitable. You either, you can't live in a straitjacket. This is so interesting. So... At the beginning, you understood to a certain extent his being protective. Yeah. And you weren't quite ready either to expose. That's right. But when you had no other choice because you were finally truly owning your right. destined path, it, there's no way. Because <laughs> you, 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 you end up, you're in a straitjacket <laughs> yeah. anytime you're with your husband at any yeah. other. <laughs> So uh, he was a great person, and um, when we said uh, so long, there was it, it was like, I don't know if anybody's ever had this experience, but it really truly was between us like a chapter had 
come to a close. Absolutely, I understand. And that. that we totally both understood that, what is that old line, that song, if you really love somebody, set them free? Yeah. And that was sort of what we experienced. And the rest of, since then, look at where we are in 2018. Right. We are about to get publicly that worldwide headline, we are not alone in this universe and we never have been, and that every human being on this planet deserves to know everything their government knows. I just, it makes me angry that I, we I, don't. I, I, I really appreciate. Okay, so here's a question I have for you. You, uh, and I'm not, I'm not sure it's the same with each of you, so it's kind of fascinating to me. Um, the anger you're talking about, you've been living with this for a very long time. Yeah. Your knowledge is vast, Linda. You know so much about what's truly been happening, and you know so much about cover-up. And you're a very bright, uh, what's your sign? Um, Aquarius. Aquarius. And I really, I think I am. <laughs> and you think you are. <laughs> yeah. You're, you are the dawning. <laughs> Another song. Uh, but, you, you know, how do you process that anger of all, knowing all of that and where it both fuels you, I can see that, which I so appreciate. As an actress, I really appreciate how you, taking your anger, moving it into a different form, which is productive. We're supposed to be a government of, by, and for the people. And yeah. it is the opposite. And it has been, the biggest irony is that we came out of World War II as the 800 pound gorilla on this planet. Without the United States, England would have fallen to Germany. And yet, right there in the seeds of what happened at the end of World War II, and our dropping the bombs on Japan. Already for a decade, our government was covering up the retrieval of clones in a wedge-shaped craft at Cape Girardeau, Missouri in April of 1941. The war didn't end until 1945. What the world has mostly only heard about is Roswell, July 47. Why? Because a general at the base, at the Roswell Army Air, made a mistake and put out a release, and this really was a mistake from the government's point of view. The right hand didn't know what the left hand was doing, and so we got a headline, saucer lands or crashes on a ranch. That was the only reason that the world ever knew about what happened in July 2nd to July 5, 1947 was a mistake. Otherwise, nobody was supposed to know. Now think about this. In a government of, by, and for the people, and that is that close to the end of World War II, when we were the 800-pound gorilla of, for freedom on this planet, and that what was happening is that a huge black thing was beginning to form in the United States in which the government was separating itself completely from the Constitution and was burying secret after secret, body after body, craft after craft, retrieval of technology after technology, and denying and hurting people in the United States who were trying to investigate, including an astronomer that I think was murdered, so the underbelly of the last 70 years is extremely ugly. And they don't want to tell the truth. But I personally think that if somebody in the United States government stood up and said, we are here to apologize and to explain why in the last 70 years we thought we could not tell the truth because we didn't know what alien agendas are. We didn't know if we could control then I personally think the entire world could hear that as an apology and somebody saying, we are now going to go forward and we're going to explain as much of this as we can. Some of it is a positive story. Of and course, some of, of it course. is not. And some of it is not. So you live 
with the frustration and anger of seeing this not being done, hoping that it will be done, and you continue to communicate. So hold that, hold that for a second. I'm gonna come over here. Caroline. The two realities, uh, organic and digital, right? And discernment. Um, what do you, how do you see what's happening in our country and what's happening around the world? What, what has happened politically, factually, as Linda is uh, referring to, and where we are now in terms of our, um, our current administration. It's the nicest way I can say it. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why I'm being nice. <laughs> Time's up, right? Yeah. Uh, we are in, we're in trouble on the, in the most obvious manner. So when you're talking about um, two realities, organic and digital, and, and, and where we are really, how do you relate what's happening to those ideas? Actually, to me, uh, what's happening now makes a lot of sense. And, but just to, to continue or to just talk about a little bit the parallel to Linda's story. So yeah. for her, it was more investigating what the government's doing and the alien agenda and things like that. And I feel like we almost complement each other because my focus was completely yeah. different. So after that first experience, I continued to have other experiences, but with beings. I wasn't seeing UFOs and I was I mean, it wasn't that sort of thing. It was more communicating and interacting with different beings. And, but that led me to um, the area of consciousness, meaning how is it possible that my consciousness or the human consciousness can interact with beings that are here? Like how does it work? And where are they coming from to interact with us? So my whole uh, focus was more about this whole quantum reality and the different types of beings in the universe. Uh, that have not just communicated with us telepathically and interdimensionally, but also manifested materially, like literally in my bedroom. So that... Uh, hello. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that has been kind of my kind of area and discovery in parallel. So my focus was not so much why isn't the government not telling us, um, because we had yeah. Linda to do that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. It was more like... Um, why aren't we taught about human consciousness? That Hi. we are capable of interacting with a bigger reality, that there is a bigger reality. So my frustration and my area of work uh, became focused on how to understand the mechanics of consciousness and how to expand our consciousness. And I feel like in parallel with the power and the control of the government, it's all about money, it's all about control. Yeah. And so it's part, that's part of the program, is to keep basically humans dumb. Right, of course. I exactly. mean, seriously. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And so, because if you're dumb or you're busy, yeah. let's give you some a lot of things to focus on, little toys, little games, little think trivial things, the busier you are and the, you know, the more focused on those things you are, the more I can stay in control yes, and indeed. maintain this power. So when you ask the question, what is happening now, it kind of makes sense to me that the, they are continuing their power games and, um, but what's different, and I think what you start touching on, um, I feel that with our current president and everything that's happening, we're being so, so polite. polite. <laughs> all of these big stories are kind of coming to our face. It's like they've been happening forever and ever, the whole control agenda. Um, power well, agenda. Certainly the power agenda over women, the domination of Absolutely. women since the beginning of time. Sure. Exactly. So why now? Exactly. That's exactly. So what I feel is that there is an awakening in consciousness. I feel like we're tired of being dumb. We get it. And I have to say in a strange way, 
this administration is helping. You know well, what I, I mean? Say, I mean, do either you know what I mean? Because the, it's um, like the irony is battering yes. rams, because battering rams. That's what we've got. And when you start <laughs> battering <laughs> everything, <laughs> everything's freedom. Yeah, it's like so <laughs> obvious. You, it's no longer a gray area. Are they really lying to us? Are they really? Oh, you know what? That's they an are lying to thing. us. They, they are lying <laughs> to us. They are doing things that uh, make a, uh, that are shameful. They are. Um, killing the environment exactly so we can we don't have the comfort anymore to be able to live in the gray it's getting clearer yeah. exactly so that's and what is I, that a good that's a good thing yes. is it not because yeah. they've been doing it in subtle forms exactly. forever correct exactly so that's that's the reason why for me in a strange way it's kind of a positive thing because when i focus on the consciousness that has been asleep for all these years is now coming to the surface, is asking for questions, is demanding the reason why, is speaking up, the women are speaking up, they, you know, all of these issues are coming to the surface. So, so that, that being my area of, of, you know, how do we bring, uh, how do we raise the awareness and the consciousness? So to me, that's what's happening. And so, but at the same time, it is normal that we are still experiencing the suffering and because there's the separation that's going on. Let's put these guys over here and the women over here and the aliens over there, not those aliens that I'm talking about, the ones across the border. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, like well, let's no, separate. Yeah. Aliens here. Yeah, aliens, aliens here. There. And so, so like with all of this. We don't have enough cages. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So with all of these separations, uh, there's still going to be some suffering. Okay. I cannot believe this. I'm looking over here and it says time's up. Do oh you my feel gosh. like we've been talking this long? I feel like we've been talking for 10 minutes. It's, it's, Although it's been, it's been good. Beautiful. But I just want to ask, I want to talk. I'm going to take a little more time, <laughs> of course. Um, the suffering. It is true. People are suffering terribly. And how do you, ladies, people like myself who are in positions to speak, all of you out there, how do we address the suffering of people who don't see a way out without um, making those people feel like they're not getting it? Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? It's sort of like, how do you allow people to learn how to rise up in a way that won't be threatening? Well, it will be threatening, but the way that's possible for them to step up above the suffering. How do you relay some of this information to them right now where suffering is, is enormous? Well, some of the headlines are giving us a guide. I think when Elon Musk says he's moving up his launch date to Mars to 2020, that's a year and a half. Once we have, let's say, an Elon Musk settlement inside of one of the lava tubes on Mars, that's where they'll go. They're strong, they're made. All they have to do is blow something inside, put the atmosphere. It's not going to be that difficult for them to get a base. It's going to extend Earth to Mars overnight. Awesome. So the whole territory of the mind and the news, yeah, I think it's exciting. exciting. You already can, you just felt it. You know that when you put Mars inside of that place that this is home, quote unquote, Earth, Mars, Moon. So then we're going to have an entire new news operation on a 24-hour cycle. It's only eight minutes by light speed from Earth to Mars, and we are already working. Harvard and other universities are working on what is called Project Starshot. And we're going to start launching little craft that are going to go between Earth and Mars, and we're going to start at 30% the speed of light, and then we'll get up to the speed of light. And that means that the communication between Earth and Mars is going to be quite livable. And once that starts happening, then the whole planet, Earth, is going to be changed. 
we will have people still planting rice in Cambodia and Vietnam, and their lives, to some extent, will be what it's been for hundreds of years. But there will be this whole new added dimension that is going to have an impact on technology. And technology is going to have an impact on what happens in the planet. And I'm praying, yesterday I did artificial intelligence, is it an existential threat to humanness? Because AI carries as much danger as not knowing what exactly are allies and enemies in the cosmos. Yeah. And this is yeah. the bottom line, and I'll stop and go, AI, artificial intelligence, the definition is code that writes code. Mm -hmm. Hold that in your head. Okay. And then you are, have South Korea, Japan, Russia, and China are building military robots that will be functioning and processing their own algorithms autonomously. Okay. So we are now at another intersection. As we go to space, they're gonna to have to introduce other life in the universe yeah. on our own planet will be the threat of what happens with artificial intelligence uh -huh. that is free to keep writing its code, depositing its code, hiding its code, rebelling against humans whenever it wants to. Okay. That is how big we are now headed for yeah. the rest of this century. So the planet gets dragged forward, mm -hmm. but it is, it's like one problem maybe gets opened up, but another one is right behind. And yeah. <laughs> I wanna know what you think yeah. is yeah. the positive and outcome. <laughs> yeah. I know, yeah, and I know that's, that's wonderful. So what the suffering. Yeah, and that relates to your question, actually, because I was going to talk about AI, because this is really creeping up on us in ways oh, we can't even yeah. uh, really even fathom. But um, so, yeah, with these openings to Mars and technology, I think some of the AI is taking us into a very danger zone. And this is where I'm starting to also lecture a lot about that, because we are at this intersection. Mm -hmm. And unless we bring the focus back to the heart, the soul, Thank you. the consciousness, the love, who we really are as people, we may lose our way. That's how I see it. Okay. And so the answer to the suffering is to bring back your awareness to who you really are, what you really want to do, and not get distracted with what else is being created for you. Got it. So to me, it's more of an inner uh, uh, focus that will get us out of the suffering. Okay. Now I'm being um, sort of signaled to we have to we have to stop. Uh, I think these are two extraordinary human beings. Can we hear it for these two ladies? Thank you. I mean, truly, in fact, we could do a three-hour podcast easily. Um, and uh, I thank you all for being here. And ladies, uh, I would love some time to continue because I feel there's a journey that might help create some bridge for people who are a, a bit more like myself. I've never been to an alien con, so I'm learning on my feet with you. Thank you both so very much. If there's anything you just want to say quickly, and then we'll be done. Thank you for making us, I think, open up in a different way than we're used to. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank I you. just want to say thank you for the opportunity, for you also opening the conversation. I think it's amazing. We need people like you as well, well to thanks, do that. Thanks, ladies. Well, we're, we like each other. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so, so very much. Thank you. Yay. Thanks. <laughs>